if you want to be a Freemason, ask a Freemason. So that's why you'll see them like with bumper stickers mm -hmm. or wear the hats or rings mm -hmm. or whatever. That's part of like how they grow the membership. And, and one of the bumper stickers is even like, if you want to be one, ask one. And then once you ask for it, then a whole process starts. And that's all I really know about it. But that's this podcast that on our podcast. <laughs> secret societies of modern times. Uh, probably time to start our other podcast now. Good timing, yeah. Which is the Video Reformation Podcast. So welcome everyone to the Hello. Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben. I'm Justin. We are the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides on your journey to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Gene Kranz to your mission to the moon. Gene Kranz. Mm -hmm. He's my favorite. Yeah. It was a guy, right? Yeah, it was a guy. Yeah. Uh, he's the guy in Apollo 13 who was played by Ed Harris and always oh, wears cool. like the waistcoat vest uh -huh. kind of thing. Uh -huh. That was Gene Kranz. Okay. So, but he was also flight director on Apollo 11. Mm -hmm. Hence the Gene Kranz to your mission to the moon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, before we jump into today's topic, which is how to conduct the best interviews, mm -hmm. uh, I, you, we, I totally should just be interviewing you for this. Sure. We should have we should have been more meta. meta yeah. We should have prepared more. Um, before we jump in, a little bit of housekeeping. As we mentioned in the last you few episodes, you mean the eight years that we've been doing this hasn't been enough preparation? No. Okay, that's right. I mean, we know how to talk about it. We just didn't know how to talk about it. Yes. yes. Yeah. Rule one for conducting a great interview: don't ad lib. No. Um, anyway, a little bit of housekeeping. Last few episodes, we have been asking you, our loyal, wonderful audience, brilliant. listeners, viewers, etc. Yeah, they're all good looking. Um, to let us know what you want to hear us talk about. Like we mentioned, we can keep coming up with topics week after week after week. But if it's not something that you want to hear us talk about, then there's not really any point in us recording an episode about it. So uh, reach out. However, you say, see maybe fit. Maybe we should say keep sending us ideas. Oh, <laughs> right, you know, right. You know, then there's like social people are like, oh, other people oh, are doing other, it. That must first. be cool. Yeah, because nobody wants to be first. No. When somebody, okay, yes. So thanks to everyone who sent us <laughs> topics. Uh, keep them coming. And if you haven't shared yours with us yet, uh, you know, you know how to get in touch with us, probably. All right. Um, we also have a new sponsor this Ooh, week, I understand. Blah, blah. Ooda Lolly. I'm bringing that back. Um, our sponsor this week, we'll get to the ad later, sure. but our sponsor this week is Squatch. I love that game. It's not the game. Oh. Did you ever see Door on the Floor? With, no. Okay. Kim Basinger. Okay. And uh, the dude. Okay. He's in it as a different character. Jeff Bridges? Jeff Bridges, yeah. All right. He plays a lot of Squatch. Okay. Well, I think this is probably a different Squatch. Cool. It's an app. I'm excited to learn about it. Oh, okay. That's all I'm going to say right okay. now. Okay. Because, you know, we want people to stick around and actually listen to our sponsors. Ad. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a short one, too. Um, okay. So, welcome to our new sponsor, Squatch. Um, now, on to today's main topic, mm -hmm. conducting the best interviews. Mm-hmm. I think before we just jump into like how to do it, maybe a little context is necessary. Sure. So why don't we first throw around a few ideas on like what types of videos you might use or want an interview for? So, I mean, the first one that comes to mind is testimonials. Of course. And a, a couple in, so I, I think that's one of the first videos for business that I think a lot of businesses think of. It's like, let's get testimonials, yeah. which is great. It's great to have that social proof. Sure. Do it. Is that queuing me up for my rant on testimonial being lower <laughs> funnel? Uh, but along those lines, there's other stuff like case studies, which is just like a different different perspective on a, on a testimonial. Yeah, really. more data-driven. More data-driven. Um, more But solution. still about something you did for a client. Right. So it helps to have the client's perspective. Yep. Um, and success stories as well. Yeah all kind of in that range they're they're all i mean yeah they're all kind of together more, right? there's I just mean, a different feel about each of those three sure i mean a lot of companies do about us videos or like mm -hmm, founders mm -hmm. stories videos those are a great way to humanize a brand mm -hmm. right and so instead of like interviewing your customers you're interviewing 
your founders, your bosses, your your employees, right? Sure. Even company culture videos. Yeah. We don't do a whole lot with like HR and recruiting stuff, but company culture videos, as long as you have like an interesting company culture video, yeah. interviewing the people within your company to talk about that is a great way to kind do of, that. Kind of along those lines, I know Vidyard for almost maybe all their employees, they interview them and create a little bio mm-hmm. video that they put into their signature. Yeah. And it's based off an interview. So it's Well and and I think that go we may talk about this a little bit later, but you know, the the point of interviewing is to get your subject to talk about you're basically prompting your subject to what you want them to talk about. Mm-hmm. So it, it would be one thing to do something like we've done in the past where you just turn on lights and a camera and it, put a new employee in front of it and say, so tell us about yourself. Yeah. It's another thing to actually have like a set of interview questions so that somebody's just prompted with something specific and then they get to share like, you know, the first thing they ever sold or the first concert they ever went to or, yeah. you know, whatever yeah. it may be. And those, those questions will reflect your company culture. Yeah. But an interview is a great way to prompt those answers instead of just like saying, sure. tell me about yourself. Sure. What else? I think, you know, brand Y videos, um, uh, you could possibly, I mean, mm-hmm. I tend to think of brand Y videos as very scripted pieces, but you know, there's a lot of authenticity that comes through interviews. Yeah. Uh, at least good interviews. Sure. And so when you're, when you're really sharing your brand, why, right? The Simon Sinek, why, I think that authenticity is you're trying to make that human connection, Mm -hmm. emotional connection with other people. And so having somebody talk about how they feel, why they do what they do is, is, might be a little bit easier to deliver that in an interview format than a scripted, because scripted, scripted can come off as insincere. Yes. If it's not done well. Yeah. So interview is a great way to do that. Yeah. You know, I, I think some products lend themselves, especially consumer products, lend themselves to, you know, not quite testimonial type stuff, but talking more about the specific features of a product, somebody who's used it or somebody who helped create it. If it's something that's, you know, that there have been developers involved in, might actually be interested mm, to hear your sure. developers talk yeah, about that could be cool. why they developed it a certain way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> There's all kinds. I mean, there's like all kinds of, of types of videos that that you could utilize interviews for. Mm-hmm. It's just a great way to. It's a great way to prompt people and get them to say what you want them to say. And I think that's where a lot of interviews go wrong. Interviewers think that they can just question, like, come up with questions on the fly, like carpet bomb somebody with, and and just throw a whole like I've got a list of twelve questions. Yeah, and you know just you know, rattle off those questions and get them in and out as fast as possible and you're done. That's not going to inspire a whole lot of authenticity or emotion or interest if you're just doing that. Uh, So I'm thinking of even some of the the promo videos we did for an event. Yeah. We asked people questions. They're almost like testimonial-like, but we chopped up a whole bunch, shoved them together. Mm -hmm. Some of those are very turnstile and get people in and out. Sure. But, um, But, you know, you, you know that you're asking them three questions. Yep. And, you do, and maybe you got a list of ten, but you're only gonna you're gonna just exactly. kind of rotate through yeah. your questions. So I think yeah, we'll get into all the tri- the tips and tricks on how to do it uh, in just a second. No matter what one of these you're gonna do, yeah. Um, there's there's a couple different things that you can you can add one, two, three, or all the things to make everything a little bit better. So, um, but ultimately, what makes a good interview? Well, I, I think I I think I. Um teased it let it out of the bag already when i said authentic yeah to me that's that's the primary reason and we discussed this like what are the elements and for me it just keeps whittling down to don't touch your face it just keeps whittling down to authenticity because if you can't get someone to to come across as trustworthy to share a personal story to to seem authentic then what's the point of putting that person on camera almost mm-hmm. right if, they, if they're you might as well fidgety, just, you're not gonna you might as well just bring in a paid actor to read a script sure right or, or a host or whatever it is if you're if you're interviewing someone you want them to convey something that you can't convey yourself about your brand your product mm-hmm. your whatever and so if it, if it's not authentic I, it's just it's wasted i mm-hmm. think so how do you get somebody to to offer a very authentic, like how do you get them to bring themselves 
like what what is it that that you like how do you get an authentic interview i think if you take what what at least what we know and i think a lot of our listeners probably know about like regular people there's a lot of anxiety and stress that comes with being in front of a camera and lights mm-hmm. and you know a foot long shotgun mic dangling you know above their head and yeah. like all, like I and mean, like that's, six that's, people standing and yes, around. And, and that's a lot of pressure. And so I think making them comfortable is so much a part of that. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, we'll get into ways to make them comfortable, but you've got to get... I mean, really just booze. I mean, what you're really... Well, and that, if that's what it takes, we've done that, right? <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, we've heard that from, from clients saying, hey, so-and-so has interviewed for us before. They're, they'd love to do it again. We did give her a shot of tequila last time, <laughs> and help. that seemed to help. <laughs> yeah. So you know, if but that's why you do pre-interviews. Sure. <laughs> uh, is to find out those those kinds of things. Um, so comfort is a big. I think comfort is comfort is a big thing because if they're comfortable, they're going to let their guard down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Because if you want that authentic, you know, response. They've got to like just not be thinking about where they are. They just kind of need to be in that moment yeah. mentally. It's almost like the first date. You really aren't. Or it's, for a lot of people, it can be difficult to be who you are because you're constantly lying. <laughs> right. Yes. You're, you got all the girdles on and the mm-hmm. spanks for men. And yeah. yep, totally graduated college. Yep. Yep. All those standard yeah. lies. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 40 and single. Uh, Where was I going with that? It doesn't matter. No. no. Okay. Um, oh, but but yeah, so what, like it, it's like just shoving someone into a room and saying, be yourself. That doesn't right. happen, but it takes time to develop that. It's like telling anyone, like, say mm. a joke. Right. Ooh. Be funny. Uh, uh. Yeah. It's, it's the same as, like, you know, be funny or don't think about elephants or whatever it is. It's your brain can't <laughs> just make that happen. Uh, I think there's an element of trust with the interviewer that needs to be there. That's also, what I was going to say trust is an important, and it's part of the comp. It kind of I, I, I guess I thought of it because that that's where you were leading it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you know if you've got somebody comfortable in that chair. Yep. They still have to. They have to trust the interviewer enough to know that like they're going to take them in the in a. In a it, direction. It, they're gonna, well, they're going to make them look good. They're going to take them in a direction yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that, right? They're going to they're going to listen to what they say. They're going to ask the right follow up questions to dig at the right moments. I mean, they may not be actively thinking about all those things, but like that's what it frees up when the subject trusts the interviewer. Yeah. Also. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, is there any element of this? So. We know in the manifesto, every video must have a purpose. Right. And if I'm a producer, director, whatever, if I'm going to be doing the interview, right, and I have a purpose for this video, is there there anything about this that makes it manipulative that I want to, like, kind of drag someone in a particular direction or, or kind of get them to say something that maybe they wouldn't have said? I don't, um... Where's the line there? I think... I think you're fine trying to get them to say something they wouldn't have said. In fact, some of those moments are the most interesting moments Mm -hmm. when you get someone to just open up and admit because you are asking the right kinds of questions and you're listening. Yeah. Um, But I, I think, I think it's, I don't think any, any interviewer should think that it is manipulative or coercive or whatever. Again, as long as you're, you're kind of creating an environment that's looking for authenticity, right? If you're making them comfortable, if they trust you. In fact, I think that that as the interviewer, it's your job to ask the right questions at the right times the right way to get them to say what you want them to say. So going back to that purpose, I mean, if I'm- In their own words. And, and it, in their own words. And it can be as simple as like, I'm interviewing this this existing client for a case study for a particular project we did with them. I'm gonna ask them very different questions than if I was just doing like, even just a broad testimonial mm-hmm. with that same client. Sure. Because I wanna ask them specific things about that project, but I, I want them to tell me how it helped them personally. How did it help them in their job? 
How did, you know, did this free up time for them? Did this save them in their budget? Did, right? All of those, you know, kind of like results based questions that I wouldn't necessarily ask in another type of interview of a client. And so I need to know exactly what I want to be editing together so that I know that I can ask the right questions. Mm-hmm. Right? Because again, if, if, if a client called, I feel like we should have a flag for when we say hypothetical situation, but it's really just something a client of ours has actually done. <laughs> um, hypothetical situation. Um, if a client called and said, hey, I've got one of our big clients visiting from California next week. Can, are you guys available by any chance to interview them? Mm-hmm. Sure. But when that's really our only guardrail, it's hard to begin to know what to interview that person about. Because all they know is they're taking advantage of this person being here physically. And they're from California. At, right. And they're a good client. Yeah. And so they want to get them on camera talking about anything. Anything. And so, and so that's that's not a good approach. And I think that's not an uncommon. Oh no! Situation I, I think that for a lot all of the time. people. It's like, it's the accounts team has the the client visiting, and then all of a sudden marketing gets win, and they're like, oh shit! Well, if they're gonna be here from California, let's, let's get them on camera. Yeah. I don't know what they're. I don't care what they say. Let's just do it. And like, I get wanting to take advantage of the situation, but there's some preparation that really ought to take place. Yes. So whether you've got a couple days or a couple hours or you've got a couple months to prepare for these sort of things, let's talk about what it takes to create a good interview. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's say that we've, like you were just talking about, we've determined our purpose, Mm -hmm. right? It's this type of video and I want, you know, the client to be able to speak to something case Mm study-ish or testimonial-ish or whatever. Um, Is the next thing meeting that person on set? Not if you want a good interview. (laughs) Okay. And what is this podcast about? About good interviews. All right. So (laughs) there's something. So no. So no. So there's something. Socratic logic right there. That's what that was. That was good. Yeah. I felt it. I totally manipulated it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Coerced. All right. Um, So let's go ahead and peel back the curtain here. Um, What's a pre-interview? Okay. So we've got, let's just say in a a perfect world, we've got a couple weeks until this this client visits or whatever it is. Uh, A pre-interview... I think it's an opportunity just to establish, I mean, if nothing else, you can establish a connection Mm -hmm. with the person you're gonna interview. Nothing more nerve wracking than spilling your guts to someone you've never met or talked to before, right? So this could be uh, a number of things, but one of them is like to prepare them for what is gonna happen on shoot day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're gonna come in, we're we're gonna have some lunch for you, you get to just chill for a little bit. Um, You know, around two o'clock, um, we'll just touch up a little bit of makeup. You know, tell them, tell them whatever the situation is going to be, right? Yep. And say, you know, I'll walk you to set. And then we're just going to ask a couple questions. And I wanted to um, wanted to help help that conversation go well. So I've brought a couple questions to this conversation. Yeah, or, or you know, we've got limited time. Mm-hmm. I've got 30 minutes with you, and I want to make sure that our conversation is efficient. Mm-hmm. So I want to spend some time talking to you now about some things that I can really dig into when we've got you on camera or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's a great excuse right. to do it, right? We've only got so much time. Your time is valuable. Yep. Even if I've got two hours, I can commit to this. I only want you in that chair for 30 minutes. Yeah. And thank you for your time, by the way. So why don't you tell me when you first started working with yeah. this client, right? And I mean, you can start at the beginning or if like the accounts person has said, hey, you should interview so-and-so because... We had a great rollout of whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, your accounts person told us that you guys had a fantastic rollout last year with blah, blah, blah. Tell me about that, mm-hmm. right? So, so, and this is this is something you could record, but it's like a phone call. It's a video chat, right? I mean, yeah. this, is a, this is an internal research opportunity. And so it's basically a way to have a casual conversation to understand, at least for me, I think it's, it's to find the stories that you want to get them to tell in more detail. And that to me is another 
another big benefit of the pre-interview is you're kind of priming them for things that they may not have thought about for a while or ever really verbalized. Mm -hmm. So by asking them, you know, tell me about the rollout with product X. They get to kind of work through what happened. You get to take notes of, of some of the key points. You get to, you, you'll hear them say something and you'll be like, ooh, tell me more about that, right? And you dig in. Well, they're kind of organizing it in their head so that when you interview them two weeks later, that you know for a fact they've verbalized it before. Because mm -hmm. that's something that's so hard with, well, non-professionals. I think, I think this goes back to the whole like non-actor you know, employee kind mm -hmm. of argument is if, if they haven't thought about it, you don't want them to memorize their answer, right. but you want to just prime the question enough so that at least at one point they've talked through it and they kind of know at least they remember the bullet points in their head. So kind of like what, what this, I think they say it about lawyers, never ask a question you don't know the answer to, mm -hmm. but where's the line between what, what you're saying of, of get them to organize these things ahead of time. And then on set, actually, either as you're in the moment or intentionally surprising them to get a very authentic reaction. So so where's the line between knowing exactly what they're gonna say and, and not knowing where they're gonna go with something because you want to kind of get that very like feel authentic. real yeah, yeah yeah so i, th I think i think a trap a lot of companies and, and even younger production companies fall into is the subject requests the question in advance mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. first I off talk, i mean for conan and if, those if things. they're doing that that means you probably haven't done a pre-interview mm -hmm. because if you've done a pre-interview you've told them exactly like you were saying this is what the interview is going to be like. I want to talk about it, right? And so yeah. what they do is they tend to do this like day before the interview. It's like, hey, um, still excited for tomorrow. I wonder if you could just send me the questions you're going to ask me. What happens seven times out of ten is that those people go home that night mm -hmm. and they write out answers to yep. those questions. And when they write out answers to those questions, they memorize those answers. Yeah. And so if you ask the same question the next day, you're going to get a very memorized, stilted answer. Mm -hmm. So, well, tip and trick here. If you've done a pre-interview and your subject still wants the questions in advance, send them questions in advance to get them to think about things, but don't ask the same questions in the interview. More Maybe like more, more bullet-pointed type. We're going to talk about this, yep. this, and this. Yep. Or, or even... In our pre-interview, we talked about this thing. Tell me more about how that affected your team. Like, could be in the in the like email of questions, so they can memorize that. But then you don't actually ask them that exact question mm -hmm. the next day. You ask them the question you want to ask, which is, when we talked in our pre-interview, you told me about blank. Tell me how that felt for you. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so all of a sudden, you're breaking them away from. They can't answer sure. the question that they memorized. But in the process of like writing it out and memorizing it, they thought about that experience a little bit, so they're still a little bit better. So I mean, that's, that's what you're saying, yeah. I, I mean that that one starts to feel a little bit like coercive, but I mean that's that's kind of the game you play, right? I mean, you want them to think about it so that they can say something concisely, because there's nothing worse. Ask any editor. There's nothing worse than like a 12 minute answer. To one interview question yeah. where there was never a period. I know. <laughs> it's just comma and semicolon after comma and semicolon. That's why they invented the crossfade. <laughs> or yeah, the cross dissolve. Cross dissolve. Yeah, I don't it's it's why they invented PR people, I think. Um, yeah. Here's your talking points. <laughs> yeah. So so um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't remember where I was going with that, but who who should be doing this pre interview? Would, uh, so whoever's going to be the interviewer mm -hmm. is the person who should be conducting the pre-interview. Mm -hmm. And actually asking the person who's being interviewed. Yeah. Not just PR team to PR team. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because, that, again, you get back to that comfort and trust on right. set. If, if you've prompted me two weeks ago some questions, <clears throat> and now I'm meeting you in person the first time, and you're doing all these other things that we're about to talk about mm -hmm. on set... I'm going to feel a connection with you more so than I have with anyone else in the room. Mm -hmm. Because at least I've had a phone call with you mm -hmm. before. And there could be six other people in the crew. 
none of them are going to ask me any questions. So that's fine because I'm walking into a room and the one person I feel a connection with is the person who's going to be asking me questions. Yep. So before we get to shoot day, what do, what do we need to have? At, like after the pre-interview, we've, we've established some trust, some connection, um, made them feel comfortable about what's about to happen. Um, what's our, what's our ideal result or what, what do you take away from that sort of thing? The experience. So at the very least you come away with the direction you want your questions to go for that particular person, right? These are the moments that I want to get them to they really lit expand up when upon. They, talked they really about lit this. up when they talked about this or, you know, really kept coming back to, I hate emails. Right. And, and, you know, maybe you're talking about like a project management platform or something. Yeah. And this person kept talking about, well, I mean, that could be the theme of the entire piece that you create sure. for that person. So, you know, make sure you throw in a question there. It's like, tell me how you feel about emails. Mm hmm. Because they volunteered six times in a 30 minute conversation that they hit emails. They probably got a little rant that they've got, which is a great way to start the piece. Right. So you start thinking about like telling the story through their eyes, telling the story through their eyes to your purpose <clears throat> still yep, yep. and creating those specific questions that you want to ask that specific person when you're in front of them mm -hmm. at the very least you should have like you should have that custom list of questions or even like at the minimum an outline of where this conversation needs to go yeah like yeah. i want to start here and then i want to get them here and i want to set them up for this yeah and and some prompts basically the best interviews that I've been associated with, the team literally comes with like a binder with subject dossiers, basically. Mm, yeah, that is like they've done. I know as a producer, I can just relax on the day yes. like that when when my director has. They've dossiers. got like notes from the pre-interview. They've got <clears throat> potential storyline directions to address with the subject. They've gone on their LinkedIn page and mm -hmm. looked at their work history. Yep. They understand how long they've been working with this company. They understand that if this is someone who's new, they may have an opportunity to say, well, how was it at your old? Like, there's all of this context yes. and all of this yes. research that they're doing that gives the interviewer this additional context, even outside of the pre-interview, that, that frames things a certain way so that imagine if I were interviewing you, We'd had a pre-interview, hadn't talked about any of your prior work before. And right before we started the official interview, I said, hey, I saw you went to James Madison. Mm -hmm. uh, I went there too. When were you there? Mm -hmm. Right? And like, even if it's not a part of, you know, it didn't come up in the pre-interview, but all of a sudden that's another connection point. That's yep. a comfort and trust point. Um, or see that, you know, this person works for a client of your client. And the last place where they worked was actually for a competitor of your client. Mm -hmm. That may not be something that came up in the pre-interview conversation, sure. but is all of a sudden something that you could ask about mm -hmm. in the moment. Um, so the more context that you have, and, and I mean, it really is like a dossier. You know, if you can walk into your interview session or sessions with something like that, it's going to be hard to fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you don't follow the rest of our tips for like once you get them on set, if you've done that work going that's in, that's the most. That's, that is the most important part. Yeah, yeah. Because that that does everything, which you know makes them comfortable or more comfortable. It prepares the interviewer, and and then you can, ju if you had to, just jump into the interview. Yeah, you could. And you know, and I think it's worth also noting that a lot of times. When there's an interview set up, there are multiple people being interviewed, right? Just just for in our for, experience, at least yeah. for scaling, you yeah. know. Just I mean, if you're if you're paying your production company for a day, why have them be there for twenty minutes interviewing someone? You might as well have them interview five people over mm -hmm. the course of the day, and and so you know sometimes there's an opportunity to. Uh, identify other people you may want to interview to help augment someone else's story too. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if, if, if yeah. a subject was talking about how their onboarding specialist was vital to their success on the platform, if that's something they keep coming back to and something that's going to be a part of your video, I would try to get access to that onboarding person mm -hmm. to get their perspective on the relationship. And then maybe my video has two perspectives of the same relationship. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But without kind of doing that research and, and all of that, 
all of that work up front, you, you're just going to miss a ton of opportunity. Yeah. Having that dynamic between those two people, in our experience, shows a lot of authenticity that we didn't know we could bring to that video. Oh, yeah. Especially when you tell them <clears throat> what one of them said about the other and getting that <laughs> yeah. reaction. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So are we on set yet? Uh, this feels like shoot day, yeah. All right. So we're on set. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say we've already done the pre-interview, yeah. so they know a little bit about the day. Your subject has shown up. What do you do? Put them in the chair and shove them in a room and and say rolling. Yeah. Um. So I'm guessing no is the answer to that question. Oh right, no. Yeah. No. Uh, for those of you who didn't catch that, um. So I, I've done a lot of when when we do just like kind of internal or when I, like it's just our team running a production. Um, I'll often do the interviewing, and as a part of the crew because I'm still there. I'm there early on helping set things up or whatever it is. But as soon as that person gets on set, it's my job to make them feel comfortable. Yeah. And this is we're talking about a small production. We're talking about you know a camera operator or two, an audio guy. And yeah. some in like a grip or whatever it is. And and we're talking when when we say on set, we're talking about like they've been brought to the conference room where you're filming or the Airbnb that you rented or whatever. Like the studio. They show up. Not not like actually in front of the camera. Sure. Once they're on location, on location they are yeah. interviewer's responsibility to That's how I, I look at it as like you're kind of a producer, director, interviewer, best friend, um, you know guide anybody could do it i think it's more valuable when it's the interviewer doing it sure yeah yep right because because again maybe there's maybe they showed up early and the team's still setting up well, great have 15 minutes more pre-interview conversation mm -hmm. right yeah talk about i mean we did an interview recently where in the pre-interview we found out that uh, uh one of the guys is like in this latin dance group mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like he and his wife are competitive latin dancers that has nothing to do with like the client relationship yeah but it was something that that gave you a level of like him that you would never guess mm -hmm. uh, yeah right but it's something that he does light up when he talks about and so you know but that folded into the story so nicely too yeah because we realized that our client's solution gave him the ability to have more free time and travel with his wife and dance yeah. and yeah. Uh, made for a much better story. But, you know, that, <clears throat> that's the time to, you know, before you've brought them in front of the camera, that's the time to say, all right, I got to hear more about this Latin competitive Latin mm -hmm. dancing you do. Right. Just, just again, building the rapport, making it, it's them all about the, it's all about the comfort level at that yeah. point. Um, some of these people may be pros and have been on camera a lot, but most of pe most people haven't. As time goes on, that'll be less and less the case, is my guess. Yeah. Most people you'd be used to cameras, but um, but yeah. Step one is make them feel comfortable. Yeah. That means water. That means sit down, breathe, yoga, whatever it is. Like let just get them, let them feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, and just let them know how things are going to go. Um, I also think it's as simple as like. If you're, you know, you got to mic them, you got to make up, you know, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. You know, you, you, you're you having your conversation, mm -hmm. makeup's ready for the subject. I, so I, you walk them over and introduce them to the makeup person, right? right? Hey, this is Maria. You know, she's going to be touching you up. Don't worry. You know, we'll wipe it all yeah, off all before you leave here. You know, all the jokes. stupid makeup jokes. Uh, and then, you know, but, you know, stay there. Yeah. Right? Stand with them. Yep. Um, while they're getting their makeup done, take their attention away from the fact that they're sitting in a chair getting makeup put on. Because all that is starting to build in, like, if, if you just vanished and then they start looking, cameras, lights, people, they're getting touched up. I mean, that starts to, like, build this anticipation. I mean, as a producer, would you, would you give the responsibility of making a subject comfortable to a makeup person or an audio person ever? I would not. I would not expect either. them to and know what to do. I don't. I'm not saying anything like a blanket statement about I know makeup a lot of people very or audible. A lot of them who spent a lot of time on set and are very good on it. Yeah. I just wouldn't feel comfortable taking that away from myself. As an interviewer, you're almost uh, a lot of times you're also the director. Yeah. And 
you are responsible for making sure that you get out of that person what you need out of the interviewee. And so I would not leave them just to the makeup person that you just hired and met that day. Yeah, yeah. Or a really good makeup person who has had a lot of onset sure. experience that you so, worked some with of them, a lot. Some of them I am comfortable. Like, well, that's true. That's and true. So having that experience is nice. But and what's nice is them. if you're there, then you get to transition them to their mark. Mm-hmm. In again, think about how how stressful the scenario is in that those last like three to five steps where all of a sudden they start seeing cameras and lights mm-hmm. and the mic and you know a whole bunch of people with like headsets on behind all of that gear you can like, barely staring see at them, them right but they're all looking at you, you right and there's like a red light there and a red light there and a red light there and lots of lenses and you don't know where to look and the grip like, is whispering to that yes, guy right <laughs> and then somebody else oh sounds speeding you're like ah. so, um, so so that's that's okay so that's a good point i don't want to jump ahead to that no though. oh okay all right that just came out no i don't want to jump ahead i think to that. we're there but like that's that is so the way that a, a lot of productions are run especially when you're used to working with talent and talent meaning professional professionals who are on camera a lot they're used to all the different cadence and calls and and whatever from from the rest of the crew yeah like striking sound speed camera rolling whatever all those yeah. things are they're used to that and they know just to stand there and chill but for someone who's never been on set with all that sort of thing, that can be very frightening. Yes. So don't do it. Right. As, as our suggestion is don't put all that bullshit. Like those things are important, right? You guys need to communicate as a team. If but, that needs but, to be through microphones, but, it, that can be. Sometimes but, it's as simple as a tap on the shoulder. Right. So that's that's how we like to do this. Is yeah. As I as I guide the person through makeup and getting mic'd up. I'll, I'll be asking them questions. It's the, the audio guy won't be saying, hey, can you do the ABCs for me? It's I'm asking him questions so he can talk and we can get sound levels approved and, and he doesn't have to know that we're doing sound right. levels. Exactly. We're just talking. We're building that trust again. And then when I get him in his seat, uh, I, you know, I guide him over there, show, show him which chair. I make him feel very comfortable like he's being... Well, and you saw him in conversation on the way there. Yeah. Right? You're, you're making eye t- contact. You're asking him about his day and he he or she doesn't have the opportunity to see the cameras and the crew and the lights right and all that and they, they get my vibe that it's like this is no big deal yeah we're just gonna have some fun and you sit out and you sit them down and then you sit across from them yep right and and, and you as, just keep talking right and in the background you know i'm on a cam right over your shoulder <laughs> and i'll make eye contact with anthony and anthony will kind of give me like the wave or whatever to know that Oh, and we've all started rolling before you walk the person up. Yeah. Right? So everybody's already rolling. And then audio last adjustments, focus, camera. audio, all those little last adjustments. And then when everybody's ready through just eye contact, you know, a wink, a wave, you know, as, as you know, secret as possible. Sure. Right? As covert as possible. Or just calm and, yeah. And then, and then you know, I typically then just give you a tap on the shoulder. And you know that that we're ready for you to start transitioning from conversation to yep. interview. Yep. But that transition ought to be seamless. Ought to be seamless. That transition should be completely unnoticeable. There should be no interruption from a lighting guy. No. Nope. From a from an audio guy. Or and whatever. so you roll right in, t- right from like, you know, tell me more about Your dog. this this Latin dancing competitive Latin dancing yeah. you do. And, you know, and then the first question of your interview happens to be like, you know, how much time, gosh, you're a, you're a CEO. How much time do you have to do your competitive Latin dancing? Mm-hmm. Oh, actually, I got a ton of time. Oh, well, what, what gives you that time, right? What, what yeah. is, you know, I mean, you, you can find those transition moments yeah. to just kind of seamlessly go from the casual conversation to what it is you want them to to talk about ideally after about 15 minutes they should ask the question when are we going to start the interview start? yeah and then it's and then it's like uh well we already have yeah. we're, we're doing it and you can see this like relief just kind of wash over them like oh this is easy like mm-hmm. I, okay all right i'm good this is fine we're yeah. i'm already halfway done <laughs> yeah exactly 
um, also fun is at the end of the interview, then say, okay, we'll roll this time. And then <laughs> every you, time. <laughs> every time. Because, you know, it's a new subject every time. So it's the first time yeah, they've heard the it. Yeah, the first time we heard it. Okay. I feel like... I feel like we've got them in the chair, we're rolling, um, and they're talking to us. Before we get into like interview styles and questions, mm-hmm. it seems like it's time for our sponsor ad. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've been primarily trying to sell 60 second ads okay. uh, up until now, right? And then of course we have our discussion. Right. right. That's right. just the value add that, that we provide. Something they can't they can't even Sorry. purchase. Right. It, just... It's be, because it's it's priceless. Yeah. Right. Um, we've recently started experimenting more with fifteen and thirty second spots, mm-hmm. and this is actually one of those. Oh, okay. So this one's shorter, but I do think based on your experience with it, we'll have some discussion. Sure. Um, uh, about it. So, without further ado, here's our new sponsor, Squatch. <clears throat> Squatch, the newest dating app exclusively for those over six feet and hairy. Men, women, hetero, LGBTQ, no problem. Just be able to be mistaken for a Bigfoot on a misty day. Join now to enter and win an all-expense-paid trip to, for two to Willow Creek, California, epicenter of the Sasquatch world. Squatch. Rawr. I didn't get the beginning timing, but I think it was pretty close. Hmm. Yeah. Um... So now I know you've used this app in the past because you are, I, in I, fact, I didn't easily mistakable for a Sasquatch on a misty day. Often, yeah. Yes. Um, I didn't know we were going to... I have a wife and kids. <laughs> well, sure. I you're not. We I mean, make this... I didn't know you were like, a current user. I just met in your past. <laughs> Can't you see it written all over my face? I'm... I, of, wow. I, I didn't know that's where this was going. I, I just... Yeah. You've talked about it before. Before it was an app, when it was like a matchmaking service. Yeah. You know, uh, seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I I had no idea you've been using it recently. That's um, um, your wife or kids don't listen to the podcast, do they? No. Okay. Well. Nobody I know does. Then I'm sure you're fine. Okay. Um. Well, but, in that case. Yes. In that case, what do you think the app might be like, based on your experience with the seven or eight years ago? Yeah. Yeah. Man. I bet it's come a long way. Um, I, I, cause I think you can tall, hairy people are just naturally drawn to each other. Yeah. Well, we get stuck together like Velcro. Yes. Okay. So that's part of it when you walk by. I see. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, but, um, I think there's a lot of different nuances to the squash game. Mm-hmm. Um, some are just go for like overall mass. Right. Some are about mass. Mm-hmm. Some are about height. Some are about strength. Some are about their ability to yell, like just how yep. how how big of a of a roar you can produce. Wood knocking. Wood not. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. In, in that same vein. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Harry's Harry's another one of those that kind of some people are more into and some some aren't. Sure. Um, but they. I imagine the app makes it really easy to filter some of that stuff. Yes. Uh, as uh, from the demo now, I don't qualify. Sure. Because I'm I'm under six feet, and I'm not particularly hairy. Mm-hmm. But I have seen demo versions of it, and their their sorting filters are really mm. very precise, but also seem very relevant to the community at large. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I am intrigued by the um, the competition to win an all expense paid trip for two to Willow Creek, California. Yeah. I imagine that would be like you and someone you met on the app going to. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. I think um, as of earlier today, uh, California has been completely shut down. However, oh. uh, people aren't allowed to leave their homes. So I imagine this is, a, this is a trip that that uh, that people have to just take later. Yeah, so you can't even sneak, you can't even wander in. I, mean, I, imagine, I guess you can try, but, you know. imagine that's how you kind of have to do it, just kind of sneak into the woods. Yeah. Hope nobody sees you. Yeah, see, but uh, it, the, yeah, it's the look back Sasquatch poses. Uh, okay, well, welcome to our new sponsor, Squatch. Yes, thank you very much. Rawr. That's just their tagline. Mm-hmm. The Rawr is their mm-hmm. tagline. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we've got our person in the chair. We've just transitioned from 
conversational kind of stuff. Our crew has silently indicated that they're rolling and all mm-hmm. set, and you, you as the interviewer can do your thing. How do you not screw it up from this point on? Well, um, like I said earlier, I like <clears throat> I like to have I do having specific questions written out. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, can, Podcasts can in the time of coronavirus. <laughs> um, probably the pollen. Actually. I mean, <laughs> it is thick today. It is. It's pretty bad. Uh, where was I? Oh, I, I like to have the outline because I, I don't want to be tied to specific wording. Sometimes that can trip me up. But I do sometimes have very specific things written out because I know based on the pre-interview, there's a there's a way that they like to describe something. So sure. I may have something written out uh, very specifically. And, it, and again, it depends on, I, I think a little bit of it depends on the type of video, whether it's in a like a founder story. Um or if it's a testimonial, some of those testimonials, like it depends on what your constraints are too. Do you have a 15 second testimonial that you need to produce? Mm-hmm. Or is it a, is it a four minute like customer story? Um, but, uh, that's a good point. That's a really good point because I mean, you can, when you get into an interview, time seems to move differently. Yeah. When you get into a good one. And so, you could maybe sit someone down for 20 minutes, and the next thing you know, it's 45 minutes later. Right. And they're still going, and you're still going, and like you had no idea that that much time has passed. Yeah. If the purpose of this video is a 15-second clip for a testimonial <laughs> video, you just, like, your editor hates you more now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But that is a good point. Um, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say on that. Good point. But, some, but uh, I think you... These are your notes here, but the um, something you learn in sales training, which is really helpful to get people to kind of tell things through their perspective. Stewed, and, yeah. And they use they use their own like their, like feelings become more a part of it. There's a little bit maybe. Yeah. So so it starts with just ask, and and this is, I don't know. I tend to think this is very basic, but I was in my 20s when I learned it, so I don't know how basic it is, but like. Anytime, so like you said, it was part of a sales training. Mm-hmm. So the part of sales training was like getting someone to open up to you as to what they're doing, what's their current solution mm-hmm. to this thing, so that you can find the opportunities to say, here's where our solution might help you with these problems that you have, right? And so it all starts from not asking closed ended questions, right? It's about asking open ended questions that get people to talk the way you want them to talk, also. Mm-hmm. So what what I found so interesting is is uh, the acronym that I was taught was STEWD, mm-hmm. S T E W D, and that basically uh, that basically is that you should start your all of your questions with either show me, tell me, explain to me, walk me through, or describe to me. Each of those commands, requests, whatever, is perfectly set up for video as a medium. Yeah. Right? Like, show me, let's edit out that example. That's not a great one. <laughs> no, so uh, start, start with a closed right. question, right? Yeah, so like, um, do you use uh, storyboard media? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, walk me through your relationship with storyboard media. Sure. Well, I met the the dashing young gentleman who owned it uh, back when they worked in the, uh, the frontier. And ever since then, I've just realized that they, it, it, so yes, it opens right. up. So it is like, you can answer yes or no. Right. And you're prompting them to explain something to mm-hmm. you, walk you through something, describe it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so there are simple, if you know through your pre-interview that, that there are certain steps that somebody had to take to get somewhere, that's a great prompt for the walk me through. Mm-hmm. Walk me through everything you had to do from the moment you had your budget approved to when you knew you could <clears> launch <throat> this thing. Mm-hmm. Right? And then all of a sudden, but then that starts to give you your little segments to structure the piece that you're going to make. Yeah. But like for us in, in sales, the show me and the tell me was a great, like, challenging question. So I was selling payroll at the time, and one of the things that we sold were like labor law posters. So. What I remember the most is like if you ask someone like, "Oh, do you have updated labor law posters?" Yeah, of course. <laughs> right, it's the law. Show me your 
where your labor law posters are. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't, you know what? We don't have any. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. I mean that that's, they can't really, sure. You know, so, you know, tell me how, tell me about, tell me when, tell me, tell me what the best, you know, benefit of working with, you know, tell me the, you know, the, the biggest advantage to what I I mean, Mm -hmm. They all just just that show me, tell me, explain to me, walk me through, describe to me. Whatever question, in fact, come up with your list of questions and then figure out which one of those just fits at the beginning of sure. that question. Right? If you're if you're struggling coming up with anything other than closed ended questions, just throw one of those phrases on the front of right. it, and all of a sudden you've got that conversation starter as opposed to If you do it's very natural for for us as humans in conversation to ask close-ended stuff because you want to arrive at an answer yeah and that's what you're hoping to get from a question but uh if you, if you do wind up there you can still put this in and just so so ben do you do you work with storyboard media i do tell me more about that well um and you go in so like you, yeah. you you even if you feel trapped you can bring those back yeah into the conversation um everybody's and, and no, that's a good point because I think my favorite, like, um, elaborate on that comment is tell me more. Uh-huh. Tell me more is my go to. I do it in our internal meetings. I do it. I do it all the time. It's if there's something that either I think I just disagree with out of principle or it's something that is intriguing to me that I haven't heard or it's something that I want them to feel confidence in. Mm-hmm. Like it applies in so many situations where I can just say, tell me more about that. But you, you're not forcing them to take any direction with it. Nope. It's a very open-ended. Yeah. Yep. Um, every, you'll notice some of the very famous documentarians. So a lot of this, this interview style, uh, this interview setup has become a part of business for video, but I think a lot of it started in documentaries, mm-hmm. trying to get people, trying to get it, people to tell a story of something that happened in the past at some point and news and news I, I oh sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. A, yeah yep and the news it's very on the fly there is no preparation really i mean if you're lucky maybe a little bit but it's really like stick a mic in their face and you get some <laughs> jerk off so you, what did you see I saw a squatch i saw a squatch it was <clears throat> misty he uh, took several large steps and then turned back and looked at me and then kept walking. That's how I knew it was a squatch. <laughs> uh, what are the, like, has, I've always been really intrigued with, like, Werner Herzog and the way that he uses silence. Like, mm-hmm. he'll, he'll ask a question and he'll, and, and the person will go on and say their thing and he'll do what? Nothing. I mean, it, it right because our default like we're not comfortable with silence, especially in the middle of a conversation. Yeah. And what's phenomenal there is I, I wish I could tell you. We'll we'll try to put it in the show notes. There's a there's a Werner Herzog video clip of him uh, interviewing like a, a doctor of some kind or like a, a morgue technician or something mm-hmm. something like that. I want to say someone had been attacked by a bear or something. Grizzly man. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, love yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, um, so there. Spirit the fox is one of my favorite. <laughs> so he's so he's he's talking to this guy, and and you know the the basic question was like, so what did you see when the body came in, or right? something like that? And the guy said, oh man, he was. I mean, he was torn up. And you see, like Werner says nothing. And you see the guy's face change, like in that moment where it became awkward silence. Mm-hmm. And then you like see the blood go to his face, and then he just starts blurting out details. Yeah, like really descriptive details. And Werner couldn't have said, "Tell me more" at that moment and gotten the same. Right. It was the awkwardness and anxiety that the silence caused that the subject felt they had to fill the silence. And so, since their brain was in that space, they just started like describing what they were saying. It's awesome. Yeah. But it's a great way to get somebody to just tell you more. Yeah. Right. Don't don't respond to them. So I think they're. they're but like, you can't even give them like a. Hmm. 
because that that is a period on everything that they said. You just look at them, and you got to be looking at them too. So, but there, but I think you can do a little bit to to do the like. It, you don't want to talk, right? You don't want to talk over them because that will well, get them to stop. That's another good point. Yeah. You also don't want to talk because of audio. You don't want most of the time. You don't want the director or interviewer's voice in the final piece. Yeah. So you can sit there, but but you can use body language to to encourage them to keep going, right? So you can be silent, which has the same effect, but uh, of like getting somebody to keep talking. But then you can go, you can kind of lean in and you know whatever, like your. What's the how furrow, you, your brow. furrow your brow? Furrow your brow. But stuff like that. As an interviewer, you have to use those tech, that body language technique, to get people to to go deeper, or or to like, or or just to get them to like change subjects. I might like cross my legs and kind of like change my body mm-hmm. position completely, just to kind of show them that I'm moving on in some way. So so going. Going back to your point about not wanting to hear like the interviewer on mm-hmm. the audio, you usually do our interviews, but when I do them, I find myself constantly nodding. Mm-hmm. Right, yes, and yes, and it's yes. and it's just the so I'm making eye contact with them as they're saying it, and and I'm not I'm not just doing this for the sake of doing this, but almost like every point that they make, and so it's like I'm going out of my way to give them a visual cue that I understand what they're saying, yep. and they know that I'm not going to talk. But it's also a great way to get them to just kind of keep going because you just keep nodding. And when you keep nodding, like, there's probably some brain chemical kind of, ooh, like, there's a validation there, Mm -hmm. right? And so they just kind of keep talking. And then when you stop nodding, they're like, like, you'll see them look into the camera lens, right, or something like that. Mm -hmm. But as long as you're, you're, like, you're encouraging them to go on, and that's a great nonverbal way to do that. What about um, and and I? I don't know how I feel about this one. I waver. How do you feel about prompting the your question in their answer? I'm I'm torn. It because it, it can. So what what you mean by that is? <laughs> it, it tell is, tell me how you feel about prompting the question in or restating the question in. An answer. So this is an example of the bad way. Uh, by restating an answer in a question, I feel like it uh, it kind of creates this like stilted conversation. But that's basically doing moment. it, right? Right. I mean, that, that that's that's when somebody says, and there's some people who swear by this, and I think those people are editors. So like, why do you like the color red? I like the color red because it evokes power and passion. Yeah. And, or so that would be that's great because you can as an editor you can cut that I can clip do a out. lot with that right but ask me again why do you like red it's a color that conveys passion and power and yeah what is right right that's like, missing like from as your an answer. editor yeah right like is it blue is it green so you would either have to fill that in with a title yeah right of like a title that says what is your favorite color or you'd have to find another way to get them to fill that in contextually Mm -hmm. and so you i mean with that you might be able to use b-roll right uh of that person in their closet and you see that they've got almost all red clothes and you can kind of like paint that picture a little bit more but a lot of time for business for video you don't have a lot of time for b-roll you're kind of cramming in a bunch of stuff in one interview day Um, I think, I mean, I keep going back to like testimonial case study or success story. I think I would probably make sure somebody did it in a case study to keep it focused, to keep it outcomes based, to keep it results based. You know, what do you think the impact of adopting this product was? The impact of adopting this product was that we had a net increase. That's something I can use in a case study. Yeah. Right. Whereas the success story is more about like, an emotional an reaction, emotional right? reaction and yeah. so I don't know that I'd prompt it there because I feel like I'd be able to kind of create a context where you knew yes. more about like you know like it could even start the piece or like you know we really had a lot of improvements since blah 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 if you are working with an experience a team that you're experienced you have a lot of experience with 
Like I know that an, this editor has the capability to paint that picture. Sure. So now we're getting into ifs and buts or whatever. But mm -hmm. if I know that my editor for this piece can does a really good job of painting a picture and we're not bound by 30 seconds or whatever it is, I have a little bit more flexibility in, in getting those answers. And I can I can ask contextual follow-ups. Um, but I like the reason not to do not to ask them to repeat their the question in their answer is because that can trip people up. They they have to word things a way that they wouldn't normally word them. Right. They're actually thinking about how what to, the question was instead of what their answer is. Yeah. Yeah. Which you have to know this, the situation. Yeah. That's what I mean. Pre-interviews can help you uncover some of that stuff. Like, depends. Does this person talk very matter-of-factly and, and, and exact? In which case, maybe you want to get them to, to repeat it. If they're more colorful and vibrant and and full of hand signals and whatnot. So maybe I think you don't have to. I think silence. Kind of going back to the silence point. I think silence is a fantastic and it's fucking awesome tool to get people to say more without saying anything. Yeah. But I think silence is a big part of of having the conversation with them too. Right? Like not talking over them is respectful mm -hmm. and puts them at ease and makes them feel like they're the subject. Yeah. Right? This is about you know, it, it's it's the first date thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like ask all the questions. Don't answer. Mm -hmm. Right? Spend eighty percent of your time listening. Mm -hmm. Like you should be spending ninety five percent of your time as an interviewer listening to what the subject is saying, active listening, right? Right. And so silence is part of that, and it's it's replacing the mm hmm good point oh cool with the nods right the furrowed brow the the whatever but that silence is key from an editing standpoint it's key from getting them to elaborate. And it's also key for like prompting them to say things that they wouldn't say otherwise because yep. they have to fill yep. the space. How much do you rely on your list of questions? You talked about having some points about like where you want them to go. How do you use them while you're interviewing? So um, I, I know what my main points are gonna be. Like uh, ideally in, in any sort of interview situation, you've got the story already cooked up in your head of how it should go, and then you work backwards. All right, so if we want the story to be like this, then we need to, them to say these three main things. And so how can I create three questions that will, one way or another, get that first pillar? How can I create another, th what other, other three questions I can ask to get that pillar, and then, and so on. So now I've got a list of nine questions, right? I use them, uh, like, uh, I would say most of the time, I get through half of them and I, I just go a little bit deeper on a bunch of stuff or, or if they're going down a trail that looks like they're really enjoying, mm -hmm. um, if that's a, a big part of the overall vibe we're trying to go for. Well, somebody enjoying what they're talking about speaks a lot to authenticity. Yes. When you see someone lighting up, you know that they're being honest yeah. and authentic. Yeah. But I like to not just have, um, so two things, I like to not just have my list of questions. I like to have a note, like a pen and a notepad, where I can write down my own questions as we're going along. Yeah. But lately, we've adopted this, and I really like it. Is you or David or somebody will be sitting far off, separated from the conversation, but intently listening, and intensely listening, and um, and writing down interesting questions. Like they'll have the dossier, right, and they'll see that oh, this person has military experience. And how does that tie into this particular point? Sure. So sometimes David will run some stuff over to me when he knows we're kind of wrapping up. Um, and I'll have a couple more questions to add in. I, I really like that because it's getting someone else's uh, ideas in there. This isn't even in our notes, but it prompts me to ask, how many people should be asking the subject questions? Oh, God. Well, one. Just one? <laughs> Just one. It should be a conversation between two people. I, I that do. other people are just there capturing. They're there doing their job. The worst thing, so for any anybody listening on the client side here, the worst thing you could do in a video interview is yell out a question or from softly the, speak a question the... from the side. Because um, what happens? <clears throat> because, because 
all of a sudden they're looking over here. They're looking at that person. Right. They'll right? answer the it. The person who asked the question or the direction that the question came from. Mm-hmm. It feels like an aside. So whatever like tone or rhythm or groove they exactly. were in, that's it the, takes them out of it. Exactly. That's that's the worst part about it is I, especially when I know that I'm just I'm asking some some questions that are about to lead me to a thing, and then somebody jumps in, and I'm like, well, I just wasted not just the last ten minutes, but the whole fucking shit. Yeah, and the next ten minutes, I I have to take getting Get this back. person back to this yeah. point. So. If you're a client, don't just not yell out questions from the peanut gallery. Write it on a note card, you know, and and during a pause or during a question that the interviewer is asking, not while somebody's talking, walk it over to mm-hmm. the interviewer and, yeah. you know, hand it to them yep, or that's whatever. The and it's up to the interviewer to decide whether to ask that question or not. Yeah. Like, or, or And they'll probably get to it eventually. But if they don't ask it right then, it's because they're building to something. Sure. So don't hand the card to the interviewer, and then if it's not the next thing out of their mouth, be like, hey, what about my question? Right. Don't be a dick. And, you know, if you're the client, <coughs> you're, you're funding all this, and you really want to get something, that that probably should have been communicated ahead of time. Yeah. You know? That's true. But if it, you know, shit happens in the middle, and you got to deal with it, um, but just let the interviewer do play their game. That they, if they're trained or have a lot of experience, they're probably much better at this than you are, and let them do it. But if they never get to it, then sure, you have a right to say, "Hey, Joe, I need you to ask that those two questions there yeah. at, at the end, right?" Yeah. When they're because as an interviewer, I'll always say, "That was awesome. Thank you so much." Uh, I just like to ask my team, so I'll turn to my team guys. Anything I missed. And it doesn't take them out of a rhythm or anything. They're like, they're, again, I think that's usually they'll take like a big breath, like, okay. Mm-hmm. Like it's a little bit of a pause. It's off of them for a second. So I'm, and that's when you put in the joke where you say, I think we're ready to start rolling? Yeah. Okay. So there are a couple other, I guess, X's and O's. Yeah. What are your thoughts on camera angle mm-hmm. with interviews? Well, in... In most situations, the 180 rule applies. Okay. Do you want to describe the 180 rule? No, I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> I will Saw describe the 180. So the 180-degree rule is basically if you've got a camera on the interviewer and a camera on the subject, you you can't put any uh, – you have to stay on one side but, of oh. this conversation. Yep. So if we're talking, there's either a camera here and a camera here, or a camera here and a camera here. Mm -hmm. But there's not a camera here and a camera here. Right. You have to think of it (laughs) as if if you are in the room there, and you were moving your head back and forth, you'd be able to see both of those people. Yeah. Not, not, you wouldn't be able to teleport from here and look that way, and then teleport there and look that way. Well, and also when you think about the edit, the shot that you're actually getting. So think the reverse of, of your where your camera placement. Um, right. So if you've got somebody like on, if you're using the rule of thirds, and you've got them on the right third of the screen, they're looking toward the left. Middle of the screen. Yep. You know, toward the middle of the screen, toward the left of the screen. They're looking in the left direction. If you've got the other person on the left third, they're looking <clears> to the right. So that when you cut back and forth between the two, their heads are actually facing each other. Yep. And not the same direction, which is what you get when you put cameras here. Because you'd have both people looking off to the right or both people looking off to the left, and that wouldn't look like a conversation. Right. So if it's a a standard three-camera setup, camera on the subject, camera on the interviewer, and then your wide shot getting both of them are all on the same side. Of the room, of of that conversation. Of the conversation. And if if at home it's difficult to understand this, just look up 180 degree rule cinema. Or watch the video version, because we just did a whole lot of hand gestures. Yeah. Um, Other camera placement uh, techniques. I used to be really big on... So I, I, I have... I have had a deep-seated hatred for testimonials for many years. I don't even know where it comes from. I think it's I think because it's just intellectually lazy. Yeah, that, I think and that's so why it's you don't overused. Like it. <laughs> yeah, right. So for a long time, just to break up the constant stream of like documentary, somebody looking at an interviewer off camera, look. 
I wanted all of our interviews to be done where the person was looking right into camera. Because when I think about the viewer, I think that the viewer is going to be more engaged with somebody who's talking to them like this than somebody who's talking to someone else and almost deliberately avoiding eye contact with them. But I also know that there's like a right place in the right time. Sure. It, like you said, there's a bunch of different ways to use interviews. If it's a testimonial, maybe that is straight to camera to say like, I use this or an endorsement or something, right? Like yeah. I use this and you should too. Yeah. I mean, I, if you're doing a testimonial, likely one of the questions you're asking is what would you tell someone who's considering using this product? Yeah. You right? then hold It'd be great to have Even an if answer. the rest of the interview was was off camera to an interviewer, I would say, all right, now don't look at me for this one. I want you to look into the lens. If you could talk to someone who was considering using this product, what would you say to them? And then, you know, make that connection. Yeah. So, I mean, it has the right time, but, you know, everybody defaults to the kind of over-the-shoulder camera, to the interviewer, just, you know, off camera don't just do that because it's what you've seen. Mm -hmm. um, Errol, Mor Errol Morris. Yeah. E R O L. E R O L. E -R -R is famous for creating this type of documentary where people are staring into the I camera. I think he even invented the Interatron. Yeah, which is a tool used to using. It's like a double periscope glass. or something. Yeah. yeah, it's like a periscope teleprompter hybrid. Yeah, and on it its projects. Side. Yeah, and it projects. It projects the interviewer's face in front of the camera. But lens. the camera looks through that glass like it does on a teleprompter. Yes. So I can feel like I'm making eye contact with the interviewer because I see their face right over the lens, and I'm also happen to be happen to be making eye contact with that lens. Uh, it's a really interesting. Tool. It is, is and there's some really interesting ways to use that. Yeah, that particular method. I mean, you could do if you don't have an interatron, but you have a teleprompter, like an iPad teleprompter. You could FaceTime yep. with the iPad from like another side of the room or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. and you know, put your back to them so they can't like follow your voice or whatever. But like, you know, you have that FaceTime conversation, and they look at you. Hell, we've even got some of our matte boxes have googly eyes on them. Yeah. Right? Yep. And just by putting googly eyes on a matte box, it, like, we're trained to look for people's eyes. Like, it just helps you focus in on that general area of the lens. So, if you haven't done it into lens, try it that way. You'll See feel something different. You will. Than the way that you've always done it. All right, let's um, let's wrap up by talking about locations. Yep. Where are some good places to do interviews? Right next to a train track? Probably not. So. Uh, Unless it's this studio. So. Which is available to rent <laughs> on it. Um, <coughs> well, I mean, there's a couple things. I guess every director is going to feel a little bit different about lighting. Some people really want natural light. Mm-hmm. And some people really want to be able to control the light entirely. And that's up to that production team, I sure. suppose. Natural light is great, <clears throat> but it can shift and change throughout the day. Shadows will move. So if you take a, and a lot of times what happens in interview or doc style interview based uh, videos is you'll take something from the end and match it with something from front because it helps tighten up the story and make things connect whatever and it's gone from cloudy to sunny exactly yeah. and so that can be an issue whereas if you have all of your light exactly controlled through lights and dimmers and there's no windows available then you don't have to worry about that as much yeah i think another thing too is um shooting with windows <clears throat> behind <throat> the subject is mm -hmm. something that happens a lot mm -hmm. uh, uh, one thing that happens a lot is that these things are shot in like conference rooms yeah. And I think that's the default because, the no, I don't know, it's people feel like it's, it's a big enough room yeah. and it can be reserved. And so the camera crew can, can work in there. But they so often end up in front of windows that then are, like, blown out in well, the they don't have enough light Because they in don't the have room. enough light inside. And you get the same, like, if you're trying to edit something from later in the conversation, you get that, that continuity issue. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't done this before... Buy some neutral density film. 
Mm-hmm. Neutral density film is is kind of like um, sunglasses. It's it's like sunglasses for a window, basically. Yep. And you can get it in like point three, point six, or point nine, which is one, two, or three. Yeah, well, one, two, or three stops. Uh, it doesn't change color temperature, mm-hmm. um, but you can adhere it to windows so that you can actually expose the outside properly for the light that you ha- that you have inside. Mm-hmm. So it may be that it goes from cloudy to sunny outside, and that does have an effect, but at least you're going to be able to see out the window yeah. instead of totally blowing out and or, just yeah, being Yeah, so you like can see your white. subject as yeah. well as you can see the outside. Yeah. And that's that's the problem with, with doing it up against windows. Yeah. Um, but, but also, windows create can create and just just like any other boardroom sound is an issue sure right in typically in 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 a whole bunch of you know four wall 90 degree angle corners sound does not work well it, it echoes in odd ways in rooms like that especially when there's like wood paneling or something that just bounces the sound around mm-hmm. so knowing that you've got to uh consider audio do you have any other like Thoughts on either conference rooms or sure. anything else. Try out. to turn off the AC or mm-hmm. the heat mm-hmm. so you don't get the fan. If you can't, make sure you get room tone. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those who don't know, you get room tone so that you can put it into your audio editor and sample a noise print to then remove that noise sound. It's not perfect, and less of that effect is more, but you can take out like a low hum from, from a refrigerator uh, or something. Yeah. But yeah, I'm plugging all that shit too, like yeah. printers that might just go off out of Neon nowhere. lights. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the basics. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you can't turn them off, then, you know, try to get a sound blanket up there or yeah. something. Try to minimize it. Uh, again, at least take take uh, take room tone. Um, you don't want to be as beautiful as the lobby of your building might be. You don't want to be in a lobby because there's going to be a ton of echo. There's going to be a ton of foot traffic. There's a problem with like what I see at WeWorks kind of thing, you know, where you can't tell that person in that office to shut up because they're a different company. Yeah. And everything's windows. And so yeah. sound bounces around. You can't control the light. You can't control the noise. Um, those are really tough places to shoot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when might you want to shoot an interview on a green screen? Uh, well, we have quite a few times. Um, so when you've got 10 different interviews lined up in a day and you know, you've got a half an hour to interview each of those people, that's five hours of actually like them answering questions on camera. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's all the time outside. There's not enough time to switch camera angles, to switch angles, to switch locations. So, So either you're, you're stuck with having 10 videos that look exactly the same. It's the same uh, conference room that you booked in the hotel. Or using a green screen. Wait, how did I start that? I don't know. I wasn't listening. You've either got got the same. All these 10 videos look exactly the same, even if they're different clients talking or different types of videos that are all just interview based. It all is all going to look the same. Right. So a green screen gives you the flexibility to take that person Put them in whatever environment you want. It could be just a neutral background, uh, like a textured background. It could, could you could put them into you could take a picture of your office and out of focus and put that behind them. You could put them in Delaware. You could put them in Delaware. Even I don't recommend it, but uh, but a lot of another reason you might want to use a green screen is to be able to create layers. And what I mean by that is you can put animations or other motion graphics or titles or whatever, you can build layers behind that person instead of having, if everything else is in in camera, if the whole picture is in camera and you've got the rest of that boardroom table and some curtains back there and the water cooler, I can't, it's hard for me to insert titles and do things uh, creatively if all I have is just a flattened image to Mm -hmm. work with. So green screen gives you a lot of flexibility in post-production. Yeah, and, and, and it opens up a lot of opportunities to accentuate a storyline or a point that mm-hmm. somebody's making. Or they get to that moment where they say, and our revenue increased by 124%. <clears throat> you get to animate in like a line graph going up and to the right. Mm-hmm. right? I mean, it, it gives you a lot of that flexibility that, um, you know, you could still do that on a regular 
you know, on a regular shot, but you know, it's just less busy. You've got you've got a blank slate mm-hmm. to work with. Okay. Um, any other tips? Those are all the for tips interviewing for having a successful interview. Yeah. All right. We're we're uh, we will be doing an episode at some point about doc style. Yeah. Right? And may have someone involved in that. I think. I can't remember. We've got too many series out at this point. But we've got too many series ideas and that we've done one episode of, and it's not a series until you do more than one episode of it. This isn't, I would say this isn't a be all end all of interviews. This is trying to cram as much as we can into an hour, 20 minutes. If you want to conduct better interviews on camera, this is the episode for you. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, some of this you'll know, some of this will be new. Happy you know. to answer more specific questions, though, if you guys yeah. have them. Yeah. Um, reach out if you guys have a very specific problem. Happy to work through any of that stuff with you. Uh, coming up tight on time. I think there's just yeah. enough time to... Uh, one more... Sponsor. Uh, one more RAR from Squatch here. <clears throat> very happy to welcome our new sponsor, Squatch. The newest dating app exclusively for those over six feet and hairy. Men, women, hetero, LGBTQ. No problem. Just be able to be mistaken for a Bigfoot on a misty day. Join now to enter to win an all-expense-paid trip for two to Willow Creek, California, epicenter of the Sasquatch world. Squatch. Rawr. Rawr. All right. Every time you log on. Never mind. And that would be great. If I, it I bet yeah, they yeah, thought that about that. That would be cool yep. if that happened like that. Yep, that's okay. Jen doesn't listen to this. All right. Very good. Well, well thanks uh, for joining me on... The podcast, Ben. Yes, thank you for joining me. I enjoyed <laughs> interviewing you and being interviewed by you. <clears throat> Likewise. I think you Very did some, some good things. I think I did some good things. I think silence. Is a powerful thing. See? You were forced to fill the silence. All right, that's our episode. Check us next time. Do the subscribing, the rating, the reviewing, the commenting. Let us know what Feed you want to hear about. Yeah. Give us some topics so we don't have to think of them. And, uh, yeah, you stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you and hear you. No, you'll hear us next time. We'd love to hear from them. We would, we would love to hear from them. But, you know, you'll see us and you'll hear us next time. I can't wait to pee. Ugh. We still have to do our outro banter. Oh, I thought all of that was our outro banter. Or is it, it's not in the notes. It's not time. in the notes this time. Okay. Yeah. I can't think of the most. Squash. <laughs> oh, we're still rolling. So, uh, are you looking for men or women? <laughs> <laughs>